Hello and welcome. Mental health is emerging a serious concern for lawyers across the globe. Today we have somebody who is willing to talk about it and he is very well known in India. His name is Chris Parsons. Chris is a senior partner with uh, English firm Herbert Smith and Three Hills. I think it's going to be very interesting to hear uh, somebody so successful is going through this. Chris, let me first thank you for joining this talk. And I think in this pandemic, all of us, we have our own concerns, personal and professional. And anxiety and fear is a very common factor, uh, which can cross through a different set of professionals, very successful set of people. And I think we are no different from that. And I am conscious that you have raised this topic multiple times on multiple forums. And you've been uh, specifically a mental health uh, crusader in multiple ways. How are you dealing right now the current situation, firstly and professionally, seeing the lockdown and COVID? Yeah, look, thanks, Babi, and also thank you for asking me. Um, you, you know that I was slightly reluctant to do this interview with you because I'm not currently yeah. in, in a good place at the moment, but you, you kindly encouraged me, and, and, um, and so I was happy to do it, and so we'll, we'll see how we go. And so let me explain where I am at the yeah. moment. Um, so I, um, for probably 20 years of my career, um, tried to cover it up, but I was struggling with um, stress, uh, anxiety, and ultimately depression, um, which I tried to self-medicate in, in two ways, I guess. One, one was through working hard and, and probably too hard. Um, yeah. And the, second, and the second way was, was through alcohol. And, um, and so I used alcohol to try and um, deal with the anxiety uh, that I was feeling. And, and, and the danger is, as I found, that if you have a sort of propensity and you, um, you self-medicate for long enough and in large enough quantities, the danger is you become an alcoholic. And, and that's what I became. Um, fortunately, that's uh, currently in abeyance and I'm um, what I guess would be described as a recovering alcoholic. Um, Chris, I've heard uh, what you said and I think uh, it can be very challenging when you have such a childhood because we all, while growing up, see an appreciation from parents and that's always be very reassuring and give us confidence and I think that's a foundation for our life and that's true for everyone in our life. And if you miss that, then I think a lot of people struggle to get that acknowledgement and self-worth to their work, to their deeds. And I think that's a point which I can connect that you have struggled to see that acknowledgement and worth through your work and through your deeds on a social front and the extremities which you take up, uh, maybe are uh, cycling for 30 days and going from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. So, and you have got your self-worth. Uh, two questions I have here. One is, you've been a very successful in whatever you have done. And you have gained a lot of friends around. You have a lot of assurance which has come your way. Your life is very comfortable. Uh, do you think it should have changed your need for reassurance every time? Or when you get out of one activity, you need to uh, do something more to get that uh, self-worth uh, and assurance for yourself? And second, in your dad's episode, when for the first time you realized that you need some help? Mm, yeah, look, um, the, the, those are important questions. Um, I, I would like to think that I have um, uh, made a whole raft of steps in the right direction from this whole question around uh, affirmation. And, um, but I, I worry that it just rears its head from time to time. Right. And however much you can, um, I, I, I guess the thing is this, that, that at least now I recognize what's happening. Whereas before, um, it was just a sense that I had to keep going, to keep achieving, to keep being um, 
to try and be perfect, I guess, to, to try and prove my worth. Um, whereas when I start behaving in a way that I can see is seeking of affirmation, that at least I have a sense of where that's coming from. And that in itself is a helpful thing. Do I think I will ever completely rid myself of it? I suspect not. Albeit, I'd like to be able to say that I, um, that, that, that I would be able to do that. I suspect it goes very, very deep. You know, it, it, you know, it, it was, you know, from a very, very early age until the time that I left home. And I guess in some ways it became more complicated because actually my dad and I had a pretty good relationship once I'd left home and once I had started working with Herbert Smith, now Herbert Smith Freehills. Right. Because he then was willing to acknowledge that I had achieved something and was proud of me. And so I then learned a different lesson, sadly. And that different lesson was that love was conditional. So I had to do something in order to be worthy of love. And so, and so I think I've got two unhelpful things going on. One is a, a desire for affirmation that I'm still hungry for, despite the fact that I understand that. And secondly, this notion that, you know, you're only worthy, you're only lovable if you do something uh, that is worthy of that. And rather than simply being enough in myself. And, and those are just horribly deep rooted and things will just bring them you know they'll just come out of nowhere and um you know i wish they weren't there and i wish i could um you know sort of just pray them away or wish them away or push them away but they they rear their heads from time to time and i just have to i think the answer is i i just have to manage them and for a lot of the time, that means that I'm in a really super good place. Right. Uh, just, you know, it's, it's also the case that, you know, sometimes I'm not. And I, um, you know, the other great phrase in, in AA is, is, is this too will pass. So that good things will pass and bad things will pass. Bad and, yes. you know, and currently I'm not in a good place, but I, I know History tells me that it will pass, even though at the time it doesn't feel as though it, it will. Um, and I was 34 years old, 34, 35 years old. Uh, so just, uh, just one question here. I think once you are uh, equity partner in a firm like Herbert Smith, which mm. means that you have done certainly uh, quite a lot of things right to be mm. there. Mm. And uh, you are financially and economically very comfortable on that front. And I believe you were married at that time. And uh, so you're saying that in spite of so much assurance on this front, you still had uh, these concerns and these bouts of depression and aloofness and uh, whatever comes with it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, well, that's the, the great, the great sadness around depression, of course, that it, it, it doesn't, take account of what would otherwise appear to be everything being fine. In fact, if anything, right. it makes the position worse because you're right on the face right. of it. I had a good job. I'd just been promoted to equity partner in a, the ultimate goal, if you like, uh, um, within a firm like Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, you know, I had a nice home. I had three lovely boys. Right. Um, on the face of it, you know, you would have assumed that I was the sort of the archetypal success story. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the sadness with, with depression is, is that you can't see into somebody's mind. You can't see into their pain. And right. whilst everything may look fine, it often isn't. And, um, and the danger is, I think, in the whole mental well-being space is that it's very easy to be able to point at somebody else and saying, but look, they're, they're all right, they're coping, right. why can't I? And of course, 
it looked like I was coping. It looked like I was fine. It looked like I had all of the attributes of somebody who should be fine. But it was a reminder to me and a, and a reminder, I think, that I share with people that when everything looks fine, it doesn't mean that it is fine. Fine, right. No, I, I completely agree. I think I can get a, some sense that it's not necessarily what is outwardly looking fine, may not be internally fine. But I think you were at a quite a critical juncture at that time. Um, I mean, newly entered into equity. How your firm handled it or dealt with it rather. Uh, I'm sure it must be impacting your work in some way, your dealing with your colleagues. Yeah, look, that's, that's a good question, Belbe. The, the answer is, is that in 1995, probably a little bit like India today, nobody talked about this stuff. Oh, okay. um, people were embarrassed to engage on this topic. I was embarrassed to engage on this topic. So right. the narrative around me going back was that Chris had been working too hard right. and needed to recharge his batteries. And that was a narrative that I was happy to support because it, it was a narrative consistent with a successful partner who had just been working too hard rather right. than the narrative that said actually there were much deeper troubles right. and um and so i i went back to work initially on a sort of part-time basis right. um what i would say is that um I, I, and again i would say this from the research that i have read through right. MQ, that the vast majority of people um, make a full recovery from right. mental health, mental ill health. And, right. so that, and, and so part of my story is, is a story of hope that actually there is life after depression and things. Right. Um, for some people, it requires a much more radical reassessment of their life. Right. And I fell into that smaller category of people for whom I needed to make a much bigger readjustment uh, uh, to my life. Um, than, and, and so actually, that was the beginning of something that ultimately became my role in India, where I tried to identify the things that I was good at, and right. the things that would give value to the firm whilst at the same time not being triggers for getting unwell. Yeah. And there were aspects of lawyering that were triggers for me being unwell. So, so it, it, it was a, even, even in 96, even though that was the catalyst for some significant requests for help, medication, yeah. counseling, etc., it took still another 10 years for that ultimately to evolve into what became my, my role as chairman of the India practice. Right, right. Is this assessment right that you've been extremely successful in India uh, purely because I think your ability to connect with people mm -hmm. and in India generally you find people once you are friends with, I think they involve you in their personal life, their family life, you may be knowing their parents, you may be grandparents. And I think that's always a very reassuring thing for anybody to, to drill down that level in terms of relationship. Do you think, I think this is one of the aspects uh, which made you so successful in India. Uh, you acquired so many friends and it's not only the friends who are your friends, I think their families, their extended families, you are attending wedding all arounds, you are collecting money for uh, Indian widows. Uh, do you think it was a sense of fulfillment for you to be in India and being so successful? Mm. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think, you know, and it, it's kind of you to say all of those things, but I, but I, I do think that is part of it, um, a, a big part of it, right. and, um, and, and, and again, I, I so I, I, I read a lot, and, um, right. and, and. It, obviously around areas that I'm very, very interested in. I also love watching TED Talks, as I, I'm sure right. a lot of people do. Yes. And I was very struck um, 
there were two particular TED Talks that I often refer to. One, think about that. And you touched on the question of the environment. So there's, there's a bit about control. There's a bit about reflection. There's a bit about listening. Um, right. But I, I think I, I, what I want to encourage in cultures that, have, that, that still have this enormous stigma around mental ill health, I do want to try and encourage leaders within organizations to right. try and change their attitude towards it. Because um, unless the, the leaders change their attitude, then other people won't. And one of the things I guess that I'm most proud of at HSF at the moment is that not only have partners spoken out publicly about their mental health challenges, but so right. have business services, so have secretaries, so have associates, so have trainees. They've recorded videos that have been shared with 6,000 members of HSF globally. And they, were, and they were willing, A, to do it because they felt the culture was uh, accepting of it. And B, I think most brave of all, to believe that it would not affect their careers. And that for me has been transformation. Sure. And um, I, I looked at a piece of research produced by the World Health Organization, uh, which, which only had data from Western Europe and uh, the US. Uh, and didn't have detailed, didn't have sufficient data from the rest of the world. But what that indicated was that nearly 50% of the reasons that people take time off work were for mental health reasons, right? Not, not for physical health reasons. And that ought to be a wake up call to all of those people who are suffering that we can do something about it. It ought to be also a wake up call to owners of businesses uh, and law firms in particular, because that's what we're talking about here, right. to recognize that actually, if they can build an environment where people feel safer, better, um, and that their mental health issues are taken account of, they could also build much more resilient and actually much more ultimately profitable organizations, because you see community of people who are fully engaged and are not struggling, you are going to have a community that is outperforming right. the work of others who haven't engaged in, in, in that mission. So that's so true. I think the WHO report is also uh, clearly specifying that if the uh, mental health issue is addressed, it's going to be a very serious saving on the economy. And that's that number is very, very significant part of global GDP. So I think that's the significant aspect of the uh, mental health to be taken care of. But I'm, I'm really glad to know that the, uh, in your society, in your firm, uh, people are coming out and talking about and their careers are not stake uh, merely because they have come out and open. This is a very, very good thing to hear. I think in Indian context, it's not so easy to my understanding. If we see purely from um, legal profession point of view, one set of lawyers are working in law firms and the other are working in courts. Uh, in law firms, I don't know if we have any kind of policy adopted by these law firms in India where they can recognize that, yes, there is a mental health issue with one particular individual in the firm and how it is to be dealt with. And assuming the person is leading on his own that mental health issue, whether his career is protected or not, I don't know, but I don't think uh, there is any uh, serious thought to it uh, in the law firms to my mind. Uh, second aspect is if we go to the court uh, uh, lawyers, we have at the top very successful lawyers who are working on their own, but I think 99% of lawyers are struggling around India to have uh, their daily meal earn out of whatever they're doing on a regular basis. So I think there is no so-called of social security for such lawyers. One, a, it's very stigmatic for them to come out because they think that they would lose their practice if they come out open and tell that they have some serious mental health issue. So therefore, disclosure is a problem there. And assuming somebody is forced by his circumstances to come out, I think there is no backup for, uh, uh, for protecting his livelihood or taking care that he can be, after uh, his revival, can be brought back into the profession. So therefore, 
that aspect is not available. So in Indian context, I think A, um, uh, I'm sure that the people who are in position can come together. And I think since you have raised this issue and once this is seen by people, this is going to be certainly talked around. I, I would like to, uh, that to happen. And the leaders in the profession have responsibility that somehow A, acknowledging that yes, this can be a problem. And second, there, there can be some collective effort to deal with this aspect and to support people who are willing to come out of this. I think uh, certainly these are uh, takeaways I think are very relevant uh, from your talk coming out. I would like to know from your side, uh, NQ Mental Health. Uh, I never knew before I read this research one with some support from this. Rabia, can, can I just yeah. very quickly, two very quick observations on, on, sure. on that, that really important point you raised. Number one is that there has definitely been some movement in the Indian law firm community around trying to address mental health right. issues. Now, I don't, because I, I, I haven't, I, I've, I've, I've had discussions with firms around um, some progress. What I don't know is where that's got to, in other words, how meaningful it is in practice, but there has been right. some movement. That, that's one positive, but work to do. And of course, there's work to do with HSF as well. The second point is, is that it is extraordinary how quick cultures can change. Because I certainly would, would have said to you four years ago, three years ago maybe, I, I think it would be very, very rare indeed for an associate or a trainee or somebody from business services to put their hand up and say, I'm struggling. And so we, it's only a very recent phenomena in the UK that we've seen these changes. We've seen some changes in... Um, in Australia, and we've seen some, but the, the legal profession sadly outperforms uh, pretty much any other profession when it comes to mental ill health. Oh, really? Yes, I think there's, so, so the, and, and again, you know, it would be very interesting to understand the research around that. Is it that the legal profession attracts the sort of people who have vulnerability? In other words, you know, is it that, that sort of thoughtful, careful, um, analytical type individual that is likely to more, be more susceptible? Or is it the nature of the job uh, with the pressures that it brings, the, the expectations that it brings, that the buck stops with, with the lawyer? Is, is it that that causes, you know, the, 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 the mental ill health uh, in a way that outperforms other other professions, or, or is it a combination of those two things? Uh, you know, it would be nice to know the answer to that. I think there was a brief uh, uh, statement by this law care uh, charity, which is, I believe, a mental health charity for lawyers in the like, UK. Yeah. Uh, they recently had uh, an article in Financial Times, and they were they were attributing saying the larger reason for stress uh, among lawyers. Uh, is purely because of the work culture, because of uh, the pay gap between the different level of hierarchy of lawyers and then the long working hours and then feeling of being left alone. I mean, they were attributing, these were the factors I think largely young lawyers feel stressed about. And uh, I think that's a fundamental factor. But uh, you're right. I think it requires a further more research and analysis to, uh, to deduce factors which are contributing towards, if you are saying, such a significant numbers in, in legal profession who are facing uh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really concerning to, to that extent. Um, do you see that the, uh, after this pandemic, we don't know when we will be back to our offices and so-called normal? Uh, like uh, uh, in India, we have not seen the courts since last few weeks. Otherwise, you are there in the courts uh, at least six, seven hours of the day. Mm. which means that uh, uh, the world is not going to be so-called normal very soon, uh, uh, which means that we will not be in courts again very soon. Do you see any silver lining in it that it is going to bring in certain attributes which are going to stay with us for longer? Simply like uh, in UK as well as in India, we have started online courts, and which is very new for Indian courts, where courts have started taking uh, hearings on uh, online through the media we are using Zoom channels and 
uh, other uh, internet connecting uh, platforms. Do you see this is sustainable? And especially since uh, my feedback is that UK courts are doing fairly well on this aspect. Although in India, we are still in the process of coming up with the SOPs and we need to see how it's going to progress in coming weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, great question. I, I, think, I think part of the answer is it depends how long the very unusual circumstances that we're um, in at the moment continue for. So I think, as I said, if it's a relatively short time, we human beings have remarkably short memories, you know, and I just go back and mention the financial crisis and, and AIDS and HIV. You know, the world suddenly just carried on as before. So I think if, if the thing is relatively short, I think we will see um, not so many, be very happy, many people to be back, to be able right. to and meet up with friends and give them a hug, to work physically as a team, as opposed to remotely as a team. Um, that's not to say that we haven't been able to prove that we can remote work. And I know that the, the Reliance Geo Facebook deal was pretty much executed yeah. The whole thing was executed remotely, which is just remarkable. Absolutely. The moving parts that are relevant to a deal of that nature, you know, whether it's due diligence, whether it's the investment piece, whether it's the commercial agreements lying underneath that. And for everyone to be joined up in a way that didn't mean that you're locked in a room to say, get this done. But I, th there's something important about that human connection. And, and I can give you an example at a very granular level, which is that, um, you know, we, we've been living, so I've been at home with my wife and my youngest son, who's studying to, being, uh, studying to be a doctor, and my daughter right. who is doing online um, classes at school and things, so she's just 14, so she's much younger than my boys. But right. my middle son, who is an actor come uh, PE, physical, um, trainer, personal trainer, uh, does online right. classes and all the rest of it, and he's been ill, so he's had the the virus, and is therefore in, a, in now in a good place because he's hopefully the, the the medics think that once you've had it, you you won't get it again. So he's he's actually he lives in London and has cycled home to be with us for a week or ten days, and I right. can't tell you how pleased I was to see him, and to be able to actually touch him and hug him. Right. And to have a conversation with him, not over a screen like this, but in real time. And there's something very different. So I think one of the silver linings is, is that we will, I hope, if restrictions um, reduce significantly, we will embrace our ability to genuinely um, link in communities in a way that we took for granted, or in fact, even worse, we said, you know, that's not what we want. It's awful. You know, I would love to be able to work from home the whole time because I think the majority of people need some boundaries. And I, and I think the whole right. work piece provides uh, a, a bound, it, it provides a, a world that we haven't yet adjusted to. And, and I think you then need to revisit the whole, what does what, what is, what is, what is the world look like? from our level if this were to go on. Right. You know, uh, uh, yesterday my daughter said one thing. Uh, she said that I don't like about mask, everybody wearing mask. I said, it's safe, what's the problem? She said, I can't see anybody smile. So it was such innocuous things to say, but, uh, but in, realistically, that's the one way a human can connect to other. And if you don't see those expression of smile, I think it's very difficult to connect with someone and otherwise it's so easy just somebody smiling at you and you wave your hand and then you know the person. I think that's so easy. But I completely agree. I think we need to learn to live in boundaries. There are going to be certain changes the way we go out, we meet people. But I think, I don't think humans can give up their basic touch and feel uh, requirement on a social level and uh, we sincerely hope that uh, we see that in a shorter time rather than what uh, the experts are predicting. Uh, 
Chris, you've been extremely brave in what you have stated today. And I'm very sure the moment uh, our talk is out, uh, you are going to receive a number of calls uh, on your well-being. Uh, and nobody is going to believe that the how sane, how rational you are and still something is going inside you uh, which needs care and concern. Uh, I really wish you a good time ahead, Chris, and healthy and uh, with complete peace. I would love to see you back in the office. And next time, whenever I'm in London, uh, we are due to share our experiences because by the time we meet each other after this talk, we'll have got to see that what we discussed and how the world has shaped up. So this is going to be an interesting meeting uh, seeing you in London. I really thank you once again. And any message you want to send to any specific person or in journal, uh, I would be happy to carry that. Yeah, look, I, I think the main message is, is that, um, you know, if, 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 